Well, we have a, a theme of um, an economic model under attack, um, and you provided some pretty stark statistics with those charts. How, how should we digest that? Well, I, th I think we have to digest it in, in, in two ways. One, one intellectually in terms of the economic system, and, and two, politically in terms of things like Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, but not only that, uh, the alternative for Germany in Germany, and, and Orban in Hungary, and the Polish government. Because, I mean, this is very simple stuff uh, that we forget when times are good is that when times are bad, particularly for a middle class and a lower class, you get the rise of resentment, of anger, of fear, uh, and rejection of elites. And this, quite frankly, was the pattern in Italy and Germany in the 1920s, 19, uh, 1930s. In America, we had, we had communism and fascist movements there during the Great Depression. So um, as President, oh, the advisor to President Clinton once said, it's the economy, stupid. And the economy has not been working well for middle class people in America for a long time. And the elites, both the right, the wealthy right and the wealthy left, uh, basically Wall Street on one side and, and Hollywood on the other, people whose lives are very, very well off. I mean, these are the people who can pay 10, 20 million dollars for condos and houses. They're not paying attention to the people in the rural areas, the small towns, who unexpectedly showed up and voted for Donald Trump. That's sort of on the political side, on the economic side, why haven't we been able to deliver more real income to middle and lower classes? And is it, is it the result of, as one of our speakers said, of, of financialization? Too much goes to finance, which is money chasing money, and it's not going into jobs. IPOs for small companies are, are, are shrinking. Uh, what about wage stagnation? We've seen wage stagnation in real terms. Yes, costs have gone down for Americans, but in most American families now, average families, both the husband and the wife have to work. It, just in order to get through. And, and if you're an older American, you remember your father's generation, which is post-World War II, mm -hmm. where your father had a, had, was the sole breadwinner, and he was able to take care of a wife, three or four kids, had at least a car, maybe two cars, was able to get you an electronic guitar so you could be like Elvis Presley. Uh, but you haven't been able to do that. So that's, that's also a decline in status and in economic terms. So these are deep trends. And the question is, why hasn't, haven't the elite, the political elite, the economic elite, the intellectual elite, paid more attention to this and come up with better answers? So assuming that the, the flag can be raised on the, the development of this tribalism, uh, what can be done to nip it in the bud? Or is this an inevitable path that we're going to repeat? Well, I think several things. I mean, first of all, people's need for identity needs to be validated on one level. Yes, you're Chinese, and the Chinese are wonderful, excellent people. Oh, yes, you're Japanese, uh, and Japanese are excellent people. But at the same time, we need to find and articulate those political, moral principles or something which are more transcendent. So you can say to the Chinese that, that while they're great, you know, the Japanese also are, are an East Asian people with, with deep ethics and morality, and the two of you together, et cetera, et cetera. Can we... Um, I think one of the, the, it's not talked about very much, but I think one of the, the disturbing factors has been the rise of, of Islamic extremism, terrorism, and the notion that, that we're, we're just divided into tribes. You know, Muslims will never integrate into Europe. Well, that's not true. Uh, Muslims cannot integrate in the United States. They want to bring Sharia law over. That's not true. I think something about religions, um, different from politics, different from the economy, but if we can get a sense that, yeah, you're Muslim, I'm Christian, he's Buddhist, somebody else is Hindu, third person's Confucian, but we're all basically good people, part of this internet and this global society. But who's going to do that work? Well, and final question, um, this conference is quite unique in terms of bringing together uh, academia, bringing together the public sector, members of government and, and bureaucracies from around the globe, and, and also the business sector, and most notably the financial sector. Uh, is this the type of dialogue that will need to be furthered to get us to some concrete solutions? Well, I would think yes, and also it's interesting that this group, which focuses on basically people who have private capital has sort of evolved and moved to an awareness that the world is not a safe place for, for the future of private capital because they need economic growth, they need stability, they don't need wars, they don't need populism, uh, and yet the world is like shifting in, in, in um, difficult and uh, difficult directions which raise uh, insecurities or reduce security. So I think, I think this is another potential point here that business leaders who to some extent don't have a dog in the fight of ideology, this or that, but they do represent wealth and, and governments listen to them, that business and financial leaders, maybe they need to step forward more 
Don't just talk about you know the best practices for giving a fiduciary advice to your clients, but what kind of an economic system do we have? Um, Joe, Joe Oliver, who spoke here, the former minister, of, the treasury minister, finance minister of Canada, politician but also investment banker, was sort of implicitly bringing these things together. Politicians have to listen to the economists, but business people have to be able to say, we, we, need, we need governments to deal with these, with these extremes and, and these tensions. Thank you.